Skagit River System Cooperative. He's going to do the next talk on strategies for increasing conifers in riparian forests of the Skagit Basin. Kurt is a forest hydrologist who's worked with the Skagit River System Cooperative for over 20 years. He has degrees in forestry and hydrology and has focused his career on mitigating watershed impacts from forestry activities. This presentation summarizes his team's experiences establishing conifers in deciduous dominated riparian zones. Thank you, Kurt. Hey, thanks. Uh, I'll ask the standard question. Everybody can hear me and see my presentation. Yep. Great, thanks. Uh, well, it's great to be here and, uh, and have all the interest in these issues. I'm gonna take you to a different part of the watershed. Um, I, uh, I work for the Skagit River System Cooperative and I'll give you just a bit of uh, more uh, information on that outfit. Um, Brenda and Tim have touched on this since we all work in the same outfit. Uh, so you know some of the basics, we work for two tribes in the Skagit River Basin. Um, we do have four uh, programs, um, watershed restoration, that's Brenda's program. These are the professionals um, with uh, riparian restoration, the program I work in is called Forests and Fish, and our main job is, is actually habitat protection. We do uh, all the permit review and um, activities dealing with forest lands and mitigating um, impacts from logging and those kinds of things. We also do a fair amount of uh, restoration, not restoration, but monitoring of um, the effectiveness of some of these things. So that's our main job, and, and the riparian work is, is a bit of a hobby for us. Uh, environmental services deals with non-forest land, habitat protection. That's where uh, Tim does uh, other parts of his job. Um, and then finally, we do have a research and recovery program that deals mainly with fish populations and response to uh, habitat changes. So um, that's who we are. Um, so anyway, uh, a riparian conference would not be complete without at least one picture of a fish. So uh, this is really why we have jobs working for the tribes um, is working towards uh, the long-term uh, difficult job of restoring salmon runs. Um, this is a juvenile steelhead here. Um, so like I said, I wanna take you to a little bit of a different part of the landscape, even though I'm um, in the same neighborhood as Brenda and Tim, which is the uh, industrial forest land base. Uh, this, um, uh, aerial here that I clipped out is to show you a little bit of a difference between um, the area I'm talking about, which is to the right of the white line, the forestry landscape. To the left of the uh, white line in this picture are the lowland areas. Uh, the pink lines show you the streams that have salmon, the solid blue have trout, and the dashed blue lines are uh, non-fish streams. And uh, the real obvious thing you might notice here is that the forestry landscape does not have many salmon um, in our streams, and that's because uh, we have a lot more topography. The other thing you would notice if you looked at a topo map is that the white line is the base of the mountain, uh, mountain front, and so there's a lot of topography that keeps the fish down low. Uh, the most important work we do, honestly, is uh, the work um, of uh, trying to maintain the supply of cold and clean water coming off of the forest landscape. The other thing you probably notice is that uh, the forest landscape actually has a lot of buffers on it. You'll see uh, clear cuts and forest roads in this picture, but you'll also see uh, the darker colored uh, mature forest buffers that are being left on pretty much all of the streams that have fish and many of the ones that do not have fish. So uh, it's a little bit ironic that we have less salmon, but more buffers, but it's a, it's, it's a good problem to have. Um, so uh, last thing to point out here is that the area to the left with uh, the lowland areas in our organization are overseen by the environmental services program and deal with uh, county and uh, non-forest uh, jurisdictional situations. Okay, so as I said, the good news is that uh, we're not seeing riparian zones get clear cut anymore. That's great. That's been the case for uh, you know, 30, 40 years now. The downside is that a lot of our riparian zones still have legacy effects from previous logging. And this is uh, somewhat typical in that we have stands that are deciduous dominated, um, but yet as in this picture, uh, there's evidence uh, in the case of a large cedar stump that conifers have been in these environments in the past. 
And that really sets the stage for the work that we've been doing in forested riparian zones. And this is a, not a, a rare situation. This is some work that my former colleague Richard Haight did 20 years ago in Finney Creek, which is a large uh, uh, stream that feeds into the Skagit near concrete. Uh, those little dots show his sample plots where he uh, tallied the uh, forest uh, vegetation. And then you've got a histogram in the lower, the lower uh, uh, left showing the frequency of different percentages of conifer. And uh, the take home there is the far left-hand bar shows that uh, around 60% of these plots had zero conifers on them. So uh, it, in Finney Creek and some other places, it's really quite common to have um, completely uh, deciduous dominated riparian stands. Okay, so that begs the question, so what's so bad about that? I'm sure uh, many of you are working in places where uh, stand and mature alder or maple would be uh, is what you're hoping to accomplish in 50 years and we have that so why is there a problem? Well obviously deciduous trees um, are effective at providing riparian functions to shade and weed debris and nutrients and some of those things but there are some downsides that have been discussed. Uh, they generally produce smaller wood that's less durable especially red alder which is the dominant species in our area. Um, the uh, ultimate height of these trees drives shade and recruitment as Tim Hyatt uh, explained quite elegantly this morning. So we like the long-term height that, that conifers will give us. Uh, deciduous trees don't live as long. So we have some su successional issues. Uh, of course, succession is supposed to be the answer to this problem, right? We're, we're expecting that even though we have a, a deciduous stand, we're hoping to see conifers come back into the understory and uh, increase their prevalence as the stand matures. But we have not seen much evidence of that in low elevation areas. The conifer trees uh, have a hard time getting established underneath deciduous stands and they really need some help to get, uh, get going so that we can uh, achieve uh, a more diverse overstory you know, within uh, the next 50 to 100 years. And then back in the 1990s, uh, in the forest ecology literature, there was some uh, talk about the potential for uh, hardwood um, riparian zones actually succeeding to a, sh a permanent shrub uh, dominated uh, community. And we haven't seen that with uh, salmonberry, which is what was, uh, which folks were talking about in the Oregon coast range, but we have seen um, uh, some limited areas where uh, Vine maple is able to capture and um, stabilize areas of the riparian zone and seems to be able to exclude other species. So um, we're not sure if this is a real concern, but there's some evidence that in places it could happen. Okay, so uh, what are the ways to achieving a, a better balance of uh, conifers and deciduous trees in these riparian zones? And uh, one of the ways is through hardwood conversion, which is essentially the uh, clear-cut logging sort of model. Um, what we're looking at here is Finney Creek um, coming through the slide. This is an aerial shot and the black line is essentially the edge of where the riparian buffer would have been if they had followed a standard uh, protection uh, strategy of buffering. In this case, um, a plan was developed to where the uh, deciduous trees in the outer part of that buffer were clear cut so that they could be replanted with uh, conifers and have full sunlight and essentially uh, treat it alongside the adjacent forest stand. So this is a bit of the industrial forest model. Uh, it's one that we, um, we help uh, landowners to uh, design and implement these kinds of uh, plans, but as not, we're not landowners, so we can't really uh, make this happen. Um, so instead, we've really focused our energy on planting conifers in, uh, uh, in understory and openings associated with these deciduous uh, mature stands. So that obviously has the advantage that it has uh, much less impact on short-term riparian functions. You retain the, uh, the wood and the shade that's been there. Um, and uh, these environments, as I'm sure you all know, are very dynamic. Uh, with flooding and um, wind events and animals uh, using these areas. So 
as peaceful and beautiful as they are when we're out there, we know that uh, things get a little crazy out there at times. And that uh, definitely impacts the work that we do. And my last comment here is just that we're, we're not in the business of recreating forests the way that Brenda and other restorationists are doing. Essentially, we're trying to add diversity to existing stands. So it's a little bit of a different game here. Okay, so these are the projects that we have been working on over the last 20 years. Uh, same uh, general neighborhood as um, you've seen in previous uh, presentations. The red dots are our main projects um, with the stream name and then uh, where it says Grandy, that refers to Grandy Lake Forest Associates. That's the forest uh, forestry company that has provided this access. Warehouser uh, has uh, supported our work at Savage Creek. And then the three dots on the right-hand side are at Finney Creek and they involve access provided by Goodyear, Nelson Lumber and Sierra Pacific. So the rest of the presentation really focuses on our experiences at these sites. Okay, so what we're talking about here are all salmon bearing tributaries. As I mentioned earlier, earlier, a lot of the salmon water is off the forest land, but in places where we have it, that's where we've done our work for obvious reasons. Um, we're working in uh, riparian flats adjacent to the stream. We are dealing with uh, deciduous stands, as I uh, explained at length before, especially mature stands where these uh, trees are in the later stages of their, uh, of their lives. And we're expecting that they're gonna uh, go into a senescence uh, period. And so once we get these conifers established, they'll be prepared to, to get some additional light and take off and, and expand uh, in, the, in the overstory. And the work that we do, unlike some other folks, is, is much smaller in scale. Uh, most of our projects are, are an acre or less with one larger exception. Okay, so Finney Creek is a stream that you've heard me mention several times. Uh, it, it, it probably should be called a river. It's a, it's a very large stream, uh, a large uh, alluvial stream that has a lot of channel migration and things you would associate with a small river. The reason that we chose to work here is because of its size and the fact that it's dominated by alder and the fact that you need large trees to provide the habitat forming and geomorphic functions that we're hoping to achieve in the long term. Um, here you can see a, a large spruce tree that was recruited by the stream that is spanning the channel and how it's capturing some of the wood that's moving by. So that's the type of function we're looking that you just won't get from alder no matter how long you wait. So uh, that's why it's important to get uh, spruce and cedar and some other trees there for the long term. Finney Creek is on the order of uh, 200 feet wide, uh, being full, so it's a large system. Um, most of our other streams are much smaller. This is Savage Creek. It's about uh, about five meters, five to six meters in width. Uh, it's very productive for coho and steelhead. Um, in this case, you'll notice it has a nice riparian buffer. But because of legacy effects, it was clear cut in the 1920s that the, it's very short on, on wood. And you can see how simple the aquatic habitat is. There's minimal pools or uh, cover um, to um, increase the productivity for, um, for juvenile fish. And so we're hoping to uh, be part of the solution in the long term. Okay, so what do we do in these sites? Um, we generally, plant three different conifer species, the same ones uh, in, in pretty much all of our sites, uh, Western Red Cedar, Western Hemlock, and Sitka Spruce. And the reasons that we like those species, uh, I'm sure will come as a surprise, as no surprise to many of you, which is that cedar and hemlock are very shade tolerant. They do well in understory environments. Cedar is a very tough tree. It seems to survive no matter what. Hemlock is a little more finicky to get started, but it can really grow well once it gets going. Spruce needs a little bit more sunlight, um, but it can grow well. And it obviously is less attractive to uh, animal browse. And then in the prems, what I'm telling you there are the downside to these species. The cedar is uh, more of a target for browse. It also can be impacted by cold temperatures. Hemlock, uh, again, has issues sometimes getting started and spruce becomes a target for antlers and the spruce tip weevil as it advances. 
And we very rarely deal with Douglas fir and grand fir, mainly because they are more shade intolerant and also become targets for animals, which we will talk more about here very shortly. Um, as I mentioned, we have focused on natural openings in riparian uh, environments. Uh, in this plot, I've got things, the uh, total growth after five years broken down into these different opening sizes with the large openings on the left. Those are openings that are, you know, maybe 50 feet in diameter or bigger. Um, the smaller openings is kind of more of a mixed overstory that has a combination of canopy and openings, and then understory is essentially full shade. And uh, this shows some, some interesting things about our uh, trio of species, um, the red cedar and the red bars. Uh, they, um, they don't seem to be as sensitive to the amount of light that they get. Uh, you can see there's not a huge difference in growth rates. They do seem to do a little better with a little more light, no surprise. The hemlock, on the other hand, um, they do definitely grow faster in the openings, um, including small openings that seems to suit them just fine. And then the spruce, which is the most, uh, the least shade tolerant of the three, uh, has a very clear uh, difference in terms of um, thriving in the more, in the larger openings. So one of those things that you expect to have happen and it's kind of exciting when it actually turns out the way you expected it. Now we normally, uh, we plant a lot of uh, nursery uh, seedlings, but we've also become quite enamored with uh, dig up seedlings that we find next to roadways. Uh, we can find um, patches of especially hemlock and cedar. We can transplant them whenever we're ready to plant trees. Uh, we can be confident that we're getting local genetics uh, because uh, uh, it's, these trees are being seeded by the, uh, the local stands. So we've um, found them to be really useful when we work at such small scales. So doing dig up trees obviously requires finding a place where you have some seedlings that are available uh, next to the road. Uh, nobody has any problems with us taking them because they're either going to spray them or, or mow them to keep their roadway clear. So no issues there. Uh, it's nice to find loose soils so you can get the root systems out without doing too much damage. And uh, the thing I have learned from tough experience is to avoid the uh, areas where there's a carpet of, of young seedlings because uh, you get a lot of trees, but they're going to be really spindly and they're going to have uh, pretty limited root systems. So they don't transplant very well. So it's better to find some trees that are a little bit more spread out and, and, and are, uh, have a little bit more energy. The next question, obviously, is how are these dig up trees doing? And this is one of our sites at Carpenter Creek where we planted uh, one side of our project with uh, dig up trees as uh, indicated by the dashed lines. And the other side we planted with nursery trees, uh, the solid lines. And uh, probably the best way is to compare them head to head. The cedars are the, uh, the line with the orange um, lines at the bottom. And then the hemlocks are the steeper lines that are green. And uh, it's pretty clear that they grow about the same speed. Uh, on both of those species. Um, and uh, so they're doing just fine. They just uh, started out a little bit smaller at their initial planting size. And so that uh, difference is, they weren't able to make up that difference, but they have been doing quite well for us. Now, most of the time we plant trees with uh, consistent spacing and just intermix the species, but we played around a little bit with this idea of cluster planting, which is to plant the three species in a cluster. The idea there is to let the trees decide which one is doing the best in that particular microsite. And so we plant these clusters at a wider spacing. Uh, and so because of that, um, as these trees advance and many of them have, uh, you do start to get competition between your planted trees a little bit sooner because they're planted so close. And so, uh, then we're faced with the, uh, of the uh, challenge of having to go in there and thin out the ones that aren't doing as well. So I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan of this, but it was an interesting experiment. And uh, we'll keep watching, see how they do. Uh, so yeah, brush control. Um, this is a problem we knew we were gonna face. 
uh, that uh, all these environments have a lot of brush species that are very uh, that are very effective at, at uh, taking over these uh, shady areas and small openings. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else feels a little bit of a twitch when they see the, the blackberries getting established in this photo. Um, that's definitely one to, to watch out for, as I'm sure many of you have found. Brush control seems to be really critical for three to five years. And then after that, it really depends on what, your, uh, what species you're dealing with. If it's vine maple or blackberry, you better not let up after five years because uh, they could still become a threat to your trees. Um, in contrast, salmonberry and elderberry are trees or are brush species that our trees seem to be able to interact with a little bit more um, and continue to thrive. So in some cases, maybe you want to control that or maybe not. We use a lot of brush cutters um, in the riparian environments to do this work. And then snowberry and ferns uh, are generally don't put up a lot of uh, competition for the trees. And so um, it's pretty easy to let those ones go and not have problems. Now, um, the one thing we have learned is once trees get taller than, uh, than four or five feet, it's tempting to go in there and do some more brushing and try to give them a little bit more light. But essentially what that has seemed to do is to aggravate our problems with uh, attacks from deer and elk that seem to think that uh, the last tree standing is the one that they need to go to battle with. And um, we'll talk more about that, but there's definitely a sweet spot as far as knowing when to let go and let those trees uh, fend for themselves and be actually protected by the brush. So uh, as far as herbivory goes, um, yeah, cedars are attractive. You can see this one uh, had a lot of its foliage stripped off by an elk, presumably. Um, and that's a problem. And we've essentially dealt with that by using a lot of XR tubes. We use the large uh, variety. They're three feet long, six inches in diameter so that they really provide a lot of space for the trees compared to the small blue tubes or the other types that get used because we're looking for a long-term protection strategy. So this antler thing is really what uh, was the big wild card that we were faced with that we did not anticipate. Um, and the problem there is that the uh, is that it happens later in the trees uh, lives once they've been in the ground for four or five years and are really starting to get above the brush and look good and you're feeling really good about things and you come back and you find out that uh, that your trees have been used for as sparring partners for the local uh, bull or buck and um, oftentimes it is fatal and um, so this has been a real uh, discouraging thing to deal with. So as far as uh, long-term survival, at our Savage Creek site over five seasons, the trees have done really well uh, as a whole. We have 84% survival after five years. We've lost a few hemlock. We've had a few spruce get rubbed um, and uh, impacted, um, but all projects have not gone as well. Uh, at our Lake Creek site, um, which was at one point kind of our showcase, after eight seasons, we're down to 36% survival. Uh, like I said, things were doing great for the first four years, and then the wheels sort of fell off. We had a cold snap in the fall, and a bunch of our healthiest cedar just turned red and died, presumably because of the cold. Beavers moved in. Um, the uh, antler rub started to happen. Um, some trees fell down. Essentially, everything uh, seemed to kind of go wrong for us there. And as far as falling trees, that is one of the hazards of working underneath uh, large, uh, brittle, deciduous trees is in a windstorm, they can fall down and take out a lot of trees. You can see there was uh, a bunch of uh, fairly nice or, uh, cedars that were growing under this one when it came crashing down. Um, I think most of, many of those trees have been uh, resuscitated and are growing, but uh, it is discouraging. And then the other thing to watch out for in the Skagit is we have some very large and aggressive beavers. My, my staff wanted to make sure that I let you know about that issue. Okay, so location issues. Um, as I mentioned, when we're looking for areas with natural uh, openings, um, I've learned that it's important to ask yourself the question, why the heck is this a natural opening to begin with? In this case, the photo is of a slope wetland uh, next to Lake Creek. Um, 
we know it was a very wet site, but we decided to plant some um, spruce in there and half of them died and the other half are doing quite well. So that was a risk worth taking, but it's always good to try to understand if there's soil issues, as Brenda pointed out, that could be the cause for uh, your natural openings and maybe uh, it's not a good place to plant a tree after all. Some cases we found uh, approximately uh, 12 to 16 inches of nice soil on top of a cobble uh, uh, layer that's an old stream bed, which uh, the trees aren't gonna be able to get their roots into. So um, again, soils are important. And then this has been a real challenge, which is the channel migration zone issue, which is channel migration zones are areas where the forest uh, owners have to leave buffers anyway, so it's a good place for us to work. And we like to grow conifers there because we think they're gonna be recruited to the stream. We just would like it if the stream would recruit them when they're about 100 years old or older and they've achieved a large size and they can provide log jams rather than when they're 10 years old and, and uh, and essentially do very little. So uh, besides uh, make a, a mockery of the work we've been doing to get them to grow. So that's a question of um, how to assess the risk of whether um, some of these uh, riparian uh, terraces are good risks for planting um, and working on conifers. Okay, so I'll pull things together here. What have we learned? Well, we certainly have uh, worked long and hard and, and had some success at establishing confers. We do know that it takes five to 10 years of, of hard and dedicated work. We weren't expecting that it was gonna take that much work, but it certainly does. And uh, also, um, even with um, moderate levels of mortality, we still feel like we are uh, on track to achieve the diversity goal. We're not trying to grow a stand of pure conifer. We're essentially trying to create a mixed stand of different sizes and different species so that we'll have conifers in the long term. And uh, one thing that we've come to appreciate here recently is the uh, issues with invasives, which are, we're a little bit behind some of the uh, ag lands in terms of uh, Himalaya blackberry and some of these uh, uh, less um, desirable uh, riparian plants. They're really, they're really making a push into the forest lands. And so uh, in the picture here you're looking at, we encountered a big patch of blackberries and really took that on as a goal was to displace that, to cut those down and to plant the conifers to uh, try to uh, return those to a more functional uh, plant community in those particular places. So in the future, we might use uh, some different strategies to try to uh, really focus on um, resetting some of those uh, invasive uh, concentrations. Looking forward, hopefully our trees will be looking like this in 100 years or 200 years. But really what I'm mostly talking about is the need to expand this work and to uh, establish a bigger footprint on the landscape for uh, areas with um, enhanced conifer composition. And this is gonna be a big challenge. Um, we're not quite sure how to scale this up. We don't have as good of access to our sites as, uh, as the areas in ag lands that have farm roads and other ways you can drive machinery around. We just, we just don't have that. We have to hike in and carry things sometimes down steep trails. So uh, it, it's just gonna make the cost be more and higher levels of effort. Um, so uh, that's, um, that's a future challenge for, uh, for our team and other folks. And then there's a real open question as far as whether these forest underplanting projects are gonna be effective at competing for uh, grant funds. And I can certainly see why there might be a preference to fund uh, areas that are higher, uh, that are at lower levels of uh, present day uh, riparian functions, such as these uh, uh, fallowed fields and some of these other areas. But at some point, maybe uh, some of these forest um, projects will become more attractive. The next question is whether forest landowners are gonna wanna do more work or want to invest in this. And generally they don't seem to want to mostly because they prefer to invest their money in the stands that they're going to be able to log again in the future. And these riparian zones really don't offer much to them from an economic standpoint, uh, aside from hardwood conversion sites, uh, which are not really done all that often. 
So that is uh, just some food for thought for you all. Um, and that is what I have for you today. And I will be happy to take some questions. And of course, I need to point out that uh, this type of effort is the result of uh, many, many great minds and, uh, and uh, people with ideas that have helped us come up with some approaches. And then in that bottom category, some of the foresters and organizations that have provided us with access and some, um, some other strategic ideas as far as growing trees efficiently. So thank you very much. There are some questions for you. Um, what is the range of animal impacts on conifer diversification? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great question. And I think the answer is it really, it varies all over the place. Um, like I said, our, we've really struggled mainly with deer and elk. We don't have uh, a lot of beaver problems that I know that other, uh, other parts of the landscape have or uh, the voles or some of the things that the uh, ag lands tend to struggle with. Um, as um, the elk herd has, um, has not really been a big player until about the last 20 years, they really expanded as the population has grown. So that's become kind of a wild card in that there's a lot more elk in some of these landscapes than there were previously. And um, we're still kind of seeing a lot of difference from year to year as far as how, uh, how many animals are out there and how much havoc they're wreaking. Some, at first it was pretty bad and I think it's kind of uh, uh, become less so, but it's, it's, it's a little bit of an unknown there, so. This is kind of a related question. Um, do you find that your dig up cedars are less palatable to ungulates or do they get munched just as frequently as the nursery stock? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I can't say as I've noticed a difference. We essentially put tubes on on all of our cedars, so uh, you know it's kind of hard to tell. Um, they'll nibble around the sides where they can get access to them, but I don't honestly notice much of a difference. Are there ways um, to work around the beavers, or are they just a menace to your planting efforts? Well, like I said, we only have one site that really has beaver problems. Um, most of these just don't have, uh, just aren't really uh, heavily used by beaver. Um, and the one site we have them, we anticipated them. And so uh, we actually built some protective tubes out of, uh, out of metal wire. We built metal wire cages because uh, the Vexar really doesn't do the job. So um, we put those in and those have worked fine. We, uh, the trees were doing so well after four or five years that we pulled a bunch of those off just to let the trees expand their crowns a little bit more. And that's really when our problems began. So um, we really haven't solved the beaver problem, but it's mostly because it's not been a major issue for us. But obviously the, you know, there are the, the serious uh, barrier uh, technologies involving metal cages and those kinds of things. And they, they do work, but, they're, they're expensive and a lot of work and um, they fall over and um, they take a lot of maintenance. This is kind of related, just asking about um, what happens after you remove the tree protectors. Are um, the trees able to support themselves well or do you notice any hindrance to their growth or um, do they try growing branches through the gaps? The yeah, they do. In fact, I love it when they grow through the gaps because they, you know, they really do need to expand their branches and, and take in more light um, and they, they outgrow the size of those uh, tubes pretty quickly. We, we have left most of the protectors on and we sort of expect the trees to grow through them. Um, the Vexar does photodegrade over time and we'll go out and pick those up where we can. Um, but uh, with the um, with the increasing problems with antlers and other things, we're really hesitant to pull those off any sooner than we have to, because it seems like it does work as a deterrent for, uh, for that problem as well, which obviously affects uh, you know, bigger trees that are 10, 15 feet tall. So, um, and with a six inch diameter tube, that stem can get pretty fat before it's really being constrained by that. And at that point, those are gonna break up is our expectation. Yeah, and that leads to the next question was, which is uh, what, what happens after the, the tree protectors are done doing their job? 
have you noticed um, the tree protectors are broken or lost or floating around the site or do you have any issues with this? Not really. At some point, we'll, you know, we'll have to reassess, we'll have to keep assessing those. And if they're not breaking down on their own, we'll, we'll have to go out and pick those up. Um, you know, I've seen some other uh, types that, that other organizations have used that are a little bit different product than ours that are, that are sort of turning into dust after five years. Ours seem to be a lot tougher. So I think we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to put in the um, effort to go out and retrieve those at some point. Um, places where we have a lot of successful trees, I'm not too worried about losing some more when those tubes come off, um, because again, we still have uh, enough, a surplus of trees. But um, that, that's, a, that's a good point. That is really kind of the next phase is going out there and cleaning up some of those protectors. Where do you source your protector tubes from? I uh, get them from uh, the same place as Brenda. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let her answer that. Uh, Pack Forest in, uh, down in Oregon, actually. And I'm one of the ones who I ask them to add more of the biodegradable elements so they break down more quickly than the tubes that Kurt gets. What factors determine the extent to which conifers will eventually replace or complement deciduous forests via natural succession? So the proximity of conifer stands, et cetera. Yeah, I've seen literature saying, uh, there was one paper that that's indicated that it really had to do with seed source. Um, you know, we have a lot of sites that have a lot of seed source and very little natural um, reproduction going on. So, uh, I think I, I haven't seen a lot of evidence for that myself. Um, the places where we've seen cedar do pretty well on its own are, are in the coarse soils, the gravelly soils and alluvial fans and places where it seems to, um, to get in there underneath the alder and do pretty well. Um, in like uh, this Finney Creek site that you're looking at this picture of and this slide here, you know, it's a very um, silty, fine textured soil. And it really just, uh, the brush just grows so much more effectively than, than, than any of the conifers. So only, the only place we really see natural conifers is on roads and places where the soil has been disturbed repeatedly. Um, so uh, I, wish, um, I wish I had a better handle on that question because it's a great one as far as scaling up and looking at the landscape scale. Uh, potential for this kind of work in places where maybe we don't need to do it or where our work should be more focused on thinning or other kinds of uh, working with uh, naturally established conifers. But, um, you know, we've really focused on areas that have very little conifer for that reason. And again, there are places where it's wetter, finer textured soils. What's the age range of your installments thus far? Yeah, they're. Um, they run the gamut from about uh, 20 down to uh, you know one or two years. We've been kind of chipping away at these projects, kind of adding one every couple of years. So we, we've got a, quite an age range and some of these sites have required multiple interplantings over time. So uh, you know some of these uh, projects have different patches that have different ages. So that's been a lot of fun and that it lets us kind of experiment and learn from our mistakes because Obviously, the reason that some of these older ones we're still dealing with them is because we didn't do a very good job at the beginning to stay on top of the, the brush and other problems. And so uh, we've had to replant some of those and um, we've learned uh, the level of effort that's required. Uh, do the biodegradable, biodegradable mesh seedling tubes from the pack forest biodegrade into microplastics? I called and asked them that and they said they break down molecularly. And so their understanding of that is that they don't break into microplastics. Yeah, I'll, I'll take Brenda's word for that. I mean, it makes sense that if the, if the plastic has been formulated to uh, break down is it, it'll continue to break down. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not an expert on microplastics, but uh, if they're in the water system and getting uh, bounced around and they're getting sunlight, uh, they have to be tough to, to continue to exist as a, as a 
sizable particle. So um, I'm probably getting way out of my element here, but um, that, that's my guess as well, that if they're built to break down, they'll continue to break down. 